Good morning, guys. A uh, great treat for you today. I'm here with a lifelong friend and um, a native of the island, Billy Burbank. And uh, Billy, thank you for doing this with me. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to. And um, Billy's family goes, oh gosh, way back. Uh, Early 1900s. Started in the 1900s uh, making nets for the shrimping industry and seine nets and gill nets. Uh, if it had anything, sports nets, if it had anything to do with netting, uh, the Burbanks were known all over the world for doing it. Um, Billy, I want to talk just a second about growing up here in front of me. And if, if you had to just pick out one item that really sticks in your mind about being a kid and growing up in Fernandina, what would it be? I guess you would just have to say I was uh, born and raised right on the beach. And I don't know when it was when I got a pair of shoes because it was a pair of shorts and sand in my feet. And our life was the beach. Uh, following granddaddy and grandmama and nanny, we call her, yeah. pop and nanny. Yeah. Uh, Saint and days. I mean, that's what the grandkids did. We followed them around on the beach yep. during the months that we had to make a living saning because the shrimping industry wouldn't sustain you the whole year through. So right. we had to catch fish to, uh, to make a living. supplement it. Yeah, so I guess I would have to say growing up as, as, a, as a young boy, uh, real young, I can remember seeing a picture of me in a little pair of red shorts eating a piece of watermelon right on the beach, right there where, right across from where uh, uh, Main Beach would be, just down from it. Yep. Uh, I was actually living... And born right there at the uh, um, the uh, um, cottages, which was the old coach. What was his right. name? Um, uh, right, right there by uh, Elizabeth Point. At this point, right now. Yeah. Anyway, that's where I was born. But that's what I remember most about growing up. Yeah, it was uh, when you talk about saining on the beach. I remember my grandmother lived on North Fletcher and. Oh my gosh, we would go singing at nighttime, and it was just, it was awesome to set that yes. net and, and bring in the uh, uh, the catch, you know, the mullet. And we would ride up and down the beach with a light shining it to catch the mullet jumping. Oh, yeah. Hey, Susie, Patui, could you hand me one needle, please? That's where the, um, that's where the fish would be, you know. Uh, Billy, when we think about, and you know, folks, we, we've talked mostly about growing up in Fernandina on all of these episodes, but today I want to branch out into uh, an industry. And that industry, of course, is the shrimping industry. And I, I think it's probably, um, and as far as the 20th century goes, it was the backbone of this island and, and, and you know, the, the economics of this island. And the Burbank family played a tremendous part uh, in that, and there's so many facets to the shrimping industry. I mean, there was standard hardware, there was net making, there was boat building, there was diesel engines, yeah. there was the Drawdy Brothers. Uh, it just went on and on and on and on. But Billy, y'all, the Burbank family, you've been making trawl nets now since what? 1900? 1915. 1915. When my grandfather. Started making his own net, so to speak, and uh, had a shrimp boat and made his own nets. And of course, he made them so well and he'd done so good that he was hired to make nets for guys who had fleets. And this is right out of Savannah area and all. And then graduated into, uh, you know, Standard Marine later in the years, you know. Right. And he got hired on by them. And that's, that's where uh, I came in in the late 60s. Of course, actually, I started when I was nine years old making nets. I saw my mother do it, and I said, you know what? <laughs> I can't let her do that, and I can't do it. So at nine years old, I got in there, and, you know, it was one of those things. That, and even today, I asked the question. I, I just didn't see it coming and, and don't know where it came from, but I have had no other job other than being a net maker. I know. I can't remember of anything else that you've ever done. No, I mean, you know, I've, I've had chores and stuff like that, but I mean, as far as anything to make a living, it's been a net maker. And, you know, I just uh, asked the Lord one day, I says, you know, how in the world did I get here? I mean, I'm just at a point of here I am yep. and I'm still doing it. Yep. And I watched uh, my grandfather do it till he was 82 years old. Yeah, 
Unfortunately, my father died at 69, but he worked right on up until his dying day. And uh, But you know, Billy, back then, that's what the men did. I mean, you know, my dad died at 59 and worked right up to, I mean, we worked at the boatyard the day before the morning that he had his final heart attack. And, uh, yeah. you know, and like your dad, I remember going down to the net house and uh, I enjoyed going down there and listening to all the, the guys talk and tell stories. And then Red Freeman, you remember? <laughs> yeah, Red. Red. Yeah, Captain Red. Uh, he was Captain a net Red. maker himself. He was good. His net making place yeah. was right next to my dad's boat yard. And yeah. I used to love going in there listening to, to all that yeah. stuff going on, you know. And yes, uh, sir. it's a shame we don't have much more of that, to, more than that, of that today than, you know, than we do. But yeah. that's the way it is. You know, back when the boats were, you know, single rigged, what was the size, general size of the net back then? Uh, most of them were in the uh, smaller range. They were only like 40, 45 foot. Now, when you, you know, say 40, 45 feet, you're talking about the mouth of the it. width of the it. Width, the width of it. Usually the length of it uh, falls right into the same pattern. Same pattern. You know, kind of like a kite. You have to balance the length of the net with the width and make it fly right under the water. You know? Right. And that's really what it does, folks. It flies under the water. You yeah. know, and uh, it's got to be right. Um, Billy, when the double rigs came in, uh, I know... I remember, you know, uh, the machine shop that we had down at uh, my Uncle Johnny's place and, you know, making outriggers and things now for the double rigs. Then the nets went to what, about 60 feet? Yeah, and, well, 55, 60 feet. And what are some of the bigger nets today? Well, uh, believe it or not, uh, back in the uh, 80s and 90s, uh, the nets became pretty pretty big. In other words, 92 footers. A lot of guys were pulling two 92 footers, and then there were some vessels that could pull four 100 footers. I mean, there were some wow. huge nets. But for right now, there's laws and regulations governing the size of nets that I don't care how big your boat is or what you can pull inside the waters. And uh, 55 foot is the norm and the average today which Chewy and I are kind of glad of that because, you know, dragging around those big old nets with all that chain on. <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah. Even though you see the nets that we're working on right over here right now, uh, uh -huh. right behind us here is going to uh, Lake Michigan. They're doing research really? in Lake Michigan on catching the fish and seeing what's in there and looking at uh, uh, all kind of species right down to the, the smallest they can catch. We put liners in there for very tiny organisms, you know, so they can see what's in uh -huh. there. But these nets are like 90 foot on the bottom. Yeah. And when Billy mentioned the chain, uh, that's called a tickler chain. And it runs on the bottom of the mouth of the net, and it, it tickles as it goes along. And, of course, if the shrimp are buried up, it tickles them, and they jump up. And as they jump up, they go right into the net. Yeah, it gets them out of the grass and, and the mud. It gets them out of the grass and the mud and uh, gets them, well, ultimately to your table. Uh, and that's where they really need to be is in front of us, you know, so we can enjoy. Uh, Billy, growing up, you remember when our harbor was just, when you looked, how many boats would you estimate back in the 60s and uh, early 70s, would you say was here in Fernandina at one time? Well, here in Fernandina, there was, you know, 35 or 40 all the time. We all had, the time. We had uh, probably up to as many as 75 at one time during the season when North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia, some of the Georgia boats would come down to Fernandina and tie up uh, space available, if there's yep. space available, and follow the shrimp down to the Cape. Because later in the year, you know, after the first of the year and all, there's still shrimp that are migrating down to the right. Cape. And that's normally where the white shrimp just disappear and die down there, but they're huge. Yeah. And and so they follow them down there later in the year. You know, uh, I think back to all the packing houses we had, uh, even going back to John Clara. Uh, John Clara had a real neat um, setup. He uh, actually, the shrimp would come into his packing house and he would uh, steam them. And then they pasteurized them and put them in, a, I believe it was little jars. Yeah. And they would box them up and ship them all over the world. There, uh, there we go. 
uh, they would box them up and ship them all over the world. And I, as a kid, I really thought that was something, you know, and I'd, I'd go out there. And, of course, all the ladies that worked there, they, uh, they knew me. And uh, we got a dog here that likes the camera. Yeah. Uh, all the ladies. <laughs> Save him. Yeah. And uh, keep adjusting this, but we'll get it. All the ladies knew me, and I'd walk away with a shrimp sandwich, you know, every time I'd go. And then, of course, we had Cook and Cook, and we had Dave Cook's place, and we had a uh, White Knight Crab Company. Yeah, let's let uh, her let it. She hears her mom out there. Let's let her go. And uh, go. go ahead. It go. was uh, it was quite a you know shrimp were being packed here seven days a week, you know, around the clock almost. Yeah. And today, we don't have much of that. No, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, there's very few boats that come through Fernandina anymore that are tied up here. You have Fernandina Seafood has four or five of the larger vessels that fish offshore, the rock shrimp, and up and down the beach, but they're freezer boats. So they come in just to unload. They may tie up for two or three days while they gear up and get their stuff ready to go refuel, and then they're back out. Mm -hmm. You just don't see it. Somebody asked me the other day if I thought that there would be a a resurgence or a rebirth in the shrimping industry here, and I I, I would love to say in my heart, yes, I believe there is, but I don't know. I mean, what are your thoughts? Well, here's what it takes. It just takes somebody with a mind and and, – to make it happen. And there's been some people here like Chris Bryant and yeah. a lot of people that understand what it's like. Yeah. We have, uh, it would just take refurbishment of the waterfront, but thinking of the tourists as well, mm-hmm. the boats just have to have a place to tie up and to unload. Right. That's what they need. And they will come because this is a good port here. There's a lot of shrimp. Oh, caught. Yeah. Everybody's gone to Mayport shrimp, but yeah. those Mayport shrimp come out of Fernandina and South Georgia as well. I mean, this East Coast is, is just the best place for a white shrimp. It I is. mean, they got them in the Gulf, whatever, but we have the finest seafood on this coast right. anywhere. Now, they're still packing shrimp uh, a lot in Brunswick. I haven't been to Brunswick. Either. Not most of everybody. Well, you got City Market. City mm-hmm. Market still does the same thing they've been doing. They've got a handful of boats right there. Downtown Brunswick, what you would call it there, the docks. And uh, so, and they still carry on as usual. But then you have a lot of other people that's either built freezers at their house they take the frozen shrimp off of their boats into their freezers, and they sell them, peddle them to restaurants, and you name it. There's some selling it online now, selling shrimp online. It's a changed world. It is. And the Internet's been a big, you know, the Internet has changed so many industries, oh, and yes. the shrimping industry is one of them that it's it's had a hand in. Well, they, had, they had to because the shrimpers are really doing well. The ones that's in it, people think, uh, that is totally dead, but it's not. The ones that are in it now that manage the money's well, manage their business, are doing very well. Yeah. I mean, you would be amazed. I laugh when you talk about freezers because I remember we grew up, I grew up on South 5th Street, as you know, and on our back porch, we had two big chest freezers. And uh, Dad would work on somebody's boat, and, you know, back in the 50s, it was hard times, and uh, they may not have the money to paint, but uh, here they started coming with shrimp and fish and squid and you name it. I mean, so, of course, all this was frozen. And we ate seafood, oh, my gosh, um, 10, 12 times a week probably. Mm-hmm. And uh, now don't get me wrong, I love my seafood. But mm-hmm. if we go out to eat today, more than likely I'm going to order chicken, beef, or pork. <laughs> uh, it's simply because that was a delicacy when I was yeah. growing up. We, I mean, we always had shrimp and fish and right. things like that. And um, well, we still do today. Me, Lindsay, and I probably most times have a low country bowl every week, at least once a week. Oh, really? We keep our freezer full, and we do the uh, shrimp and the corn and the sausage. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, yeah. Occasionally, we put potatoes in it, but uh, you know, it's just. Just delicious, quick, and easy, and, you know, it's just who we are, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's a a wonderful thing. Uh, Folks, I encourage you, uh, if you ever get a chance to go down to the docks, which I know you do, go down. If there's a shrimp boat there, you know, be sure to take a look at it. And, um, you know, we're going to – this won't be the last interview with Billy because we've got – the shrimping industry is going to be coming up here pretty soon. And uh, Billy's going to be in some more interviews. Billy, I want to thank you. 
I want to thank, thank you, you too. Me. Yes, sir. And um, this will, um, you know, a lot of folks will will see this, especially the old timers that grew up here. It's going to spark a lot of memories. And uh, for you new folks that just moved here, uh, you love it because you're learning a little bit more about Fernand Demon. So until next time, God bless, and uh, we'll see you on the road.